Are we live, Keith? I don't know. I don't know. And you, you went to the uh, the scheduled, the pre-scheduled one? I did. All right. So then I'm guessing we're live. Maybe you want to go check on uh, YouTube. I'm going to. We are live. People are watching this. Okay. Thursday Night Live. Or maybe. <laughs> Who knows? I do a pratfall right now, but I'm not far enough away from the camera. <laughs> oh, jeez! Knock myself. Still on this. Godzilla versus Tiamat. Still on Godzilla versus Tiamat. All right, we are definitely live because Dean Thirteen has just signed in and it says hello. Good to see you. Greetings. <laughs> anyway, no, just re have, fast recap. For what? Keith said so we have con we have confirmation that we're confirmation. Live. Ten four, right, Eleanor. Greg, you're gonna you're going to give us the, the recap on, on Godzilla. Is that correct? Yes. Ground control to Major Tom. Uh, th this is a, a, a private commission. Godzilla versus Tiamat, the five-headed dragon from Dungeons & Dragons, which I, I was not aware of that character. I, I, my brother did Dungeons, illustrated some Dungeons & Dragons years ago, but I never did. So in any event, I was really excited about doing it, particularly Godzilla, because I've been a fan since the 50s, of course. When you know the first film and everything, which we watched again the other night, you know, my that very first one, <laughs> which is basically an anti nuke movie, you know, yes, it's, yep. Yep. anyway. Uh, so this is the setup there's Godzilla, there's the dragon, and this is my first layout. And compositionally, just a brief, you know, I, I like that triangular shape that contains a more of a central, powerful thing. So you get a triangle and you get a circular shape with the wings and the flow of the arc. So in any event, that's that's the rough here. I peel it back, and here's the painting so far. So the the uh, the concept was, of course, Godzilla's atomic blue breath, and the central head of Tiamat, which is here, blasting the fire. But last week. Uh, the the uh, gentleman I'm doing the commission for was sent Gene a, an email while we were discussing this, mm -hmm. and the way I had the next structured was this way last week, where the next meet the body here. Well, I had what this was the, what was the issue? What was the issue? That the you... issue was that the head that I had here was not the right head. It was, in fact, the blue head I had drawn up here. And this guy, this girl, this gal, I mean, uh, she was in the center, and I had her shooting a fiery breath. But in fact, this head does not shoot a fiery breath. It shoots a lightning bolt. So I had this head up here, and I was starting it, roughing it in, the, the basic head. And when Gene came over and told me at the end of the show, I, just, I almost I had a panic attack. I said, oh, my God, that's impossible. I can't make this a light. I can't repaint this as a lightning bolt. It changes the entire lighting setup that I had in mind. Yeah. It would be totally redundant because it would just be those same colors as Godzilla's atomic breath. So you'd get the blue light and the blue light. And I absolutely insist that I had to have the firelight. So I said, oh my God, oh my God, I gotta start the whole damn picture all over again. Blah, 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 blah. I was freaking out internally. <laughs> and then I think kind of like simultaneously, the gentleman and we did, I think, if I remember right, my panic, oh, just change the neck positions. So all you do, here was the original neck position. This is the way I had it drawn before. This head, this head, this head. I simply switched this neck to the foreground neck here. See what I'm saying? Yes. See that? I simply made it come here and here. So you didn't have to redo anything. Only just area right here. So this one's behind it now. And this one's in front of it. Which I'm still working on structurally how to handle, you know, get this all looking good. Yeah. But now correct me if I'm like when we were talking last week, you know, the one that's under his, his arm. Uh, I think the issue came about because you were talking about having like the last gasp of fire. Right. And that's incorrect. And, no. and then he, he pointed out that it's different colored. Different color. This is a, a freezing breath. So it's like I, 
ice, sort of like a icy. This blue guy is the lightning bolt. The main central head is a fiery blast. The green one is a, 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 a yellow green uh, fluid, you know, poisonous stuff. And then the black guy over here is is a cloud, a dark cloud, you know, like gas or something. So they each have a different, you know, shtick. So here, I don't, you know, there's no fiery blast. I've been futzing around with, and Jean was coming up with the idea of like the, the a blast, you know, like if you, and she got some great reference from me, you know, where you go out and uh, you see people in sub-zero weather shooting a gun of, of hot water, and you see it all mm -hmm. vaporize, and, and it looks really oh, okay. cool. Yep. Maybe something like that. I don't know yet. You know, it, might, it may be too much here. I don't know. But that's a concept, you know, that I might do there. The lightning bolt, I'm not doing. I'm just doing as, as though he's ready to do it with his mouth glowing white because that would be redundant here. I'd have to do a lightning bolt across the bottom here, which would totally screw up all this lightning. Yep. The green, I, I chose not to do that. I would just want the long tongue. Maybe I have some green stuff flying off of it, you know. I don't know. We'll see. I'm not there yet. But that's yeah, the thing. Yeah, could you do something something similar like what with what you're doing in the lightning mouth to where it's like you know the power might just just start to be forming so that it sells the idea right that that's the green yep exactly so i'll get there when i get there i'll decide that after i get everything all in here and but those are you know you you do your main your layout it, you know is all set up already i don't change that that's permanent you know little stuff will shift tiny stuff but then you make those those kinds of decisions. I do anyway, and I, I am in this picture anyway. As as I go, here was the main two light sources, and the light from behind inside. All the fire in the distance, and off to the sides, off camera. There's let light, so you get all the fiery fiery edge light on everything. You know, makes yeah. it stand out. So this is to the concept is. Light against dark and dark against light. Here, light against dark and dark against light down by the bottom. You know, as you see the more silhouetted figure at the bottom. And that that's all kind of in your my head. And I think any of us, right, when we're starting to conceive a picture, you see it through a glass darkly, sort of in your mind, you know? You, yes. you know what you're yep. heading towards, roughly. Roughly. In a sense, you're kind of like looking at the future. You're hoping that this will be the future. I liken it to it's. You, you have an image there, but it's all, almost still in a dream-like quality. Yeah. Where where parts of it are fo in focus, but yet it's an overall hazy. Sort of like a Fellini movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love Fellini. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Where you know, there's that. Yeah, it's like that, and then and then you then you start to make it clearer. It's about bringing clarity, right? I mean, you you get your paper and your pencil or whatever you work on, if you work on a computer, and then you it starts to get clearer. And, and each step is like, people used to say, well, once you get to this phase, you've got it. I pretty much got it figured out. Isn't that kind of like tiring at that point? Well, not really, because you're still gaining clarity all the way to the final end of the painting, you know? Yeah. It's, it's making now it... Now, with you know, with with this image, and you were able to come up with a, a pretty clever but a pretty straightforward resolution to solve your problem, right? Like, oh, okay, I just like, switch the next, yeah, and and the issue is solved. Uh, have you? I'm assuming you have, but have you come up against something like that in your career of where you were given information? pretty far down the line or that you missed information and then were reminded of this information like this, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, no, and, I can't remember. Truthfully, I can't answer that. Maybe you could remember. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> I just don't remember. I think not since working with Jane, let's put it that way, since not for the last 40 years, because Jane is the one that gains all the clarity up front. I don't even talk to the client, whether it be personal yeah. or company or a publisher gene does all that and that's great for clarity because she's she's she knows exactly, very detailed yeah she yeah. she knows my work she knows me she knows the business 
She knows she's great with communication with people. It, it, it's all about get, getting clarity up front so that everything is all set. So that there's no yeah. surprises as you get into it. And she has structured many contracts in the past for me that if there are changes that, you know, there, whatever, I remember what the hell was it? There was some, oh, the, a guard, the, the islands of adventure in uh, the game, you know, the, uh, in Florida, you know, we were at universal, universal, right? Universal. universal doing a bunch of posters initially for the, for them before the rides were even finished and they kept adding and changing all the way along. And Gene's contract read that they would each change or increase would be getting much more money, you know, because yeah. that, that's the way that worked. And that's kind of like the way she, we, she does every contract. So no, I, there's not too many surprises as we get down the line. There may be personally for me as the artist painting it, that the decision I've, I've made how to hand like this kind of thing, you know, little, but that's stuff that you can, I've always been able to figure out, you know, is you just, you just do it. So you make it work somehow, you know? So you've never had to, uh, have you ever just like, you know what? I gotta, I gotta scrap it. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, and that's less and less and less as time goes by, but younger. Yeah. Uh, you know, cause you're, you're in white space most of the time when you're younger, you know, you, 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 you're walking into the unknown land. You don't know what the hell is, and you're learning and you're making, you know, you're figuring out as you go. And sometimes it just ain't ended up right and starting all over again, you know, many times in the past. Yeah. I, uh, I, I just had to, to scrap an image, uh, over the weekend that I'd, I had been working on, you know, off and on for a, a, a couple of weeks, you know, not a lot of solid block time, but just picking it up and, and tinkering on it. And in the initial stages, everything looked pretty good in the drawing. You know, um, I had the figure was from kind of the waist up foreground projected image, right. With a relatively low horizon line yep. at a, at a hill um so you're looking up more or less Can yep kind of yeah. low camera and, angle but what i ended up hating is that all of my background stuff because then it became so low in the picture plane yeah. ended up crashing forward oh right? i see okay <laughs> and i had no means of pushing it back other than color value but still visually everything just seemed yeah right there and so I made the distinction to just, uh, I'm going to scrap it, <laughs> All right. rework that horizon and background so I can push it back Yeah, and then, and then have another go at it. Don't you hate that when that happens? I do. <laughs> I do. <laughs> it, you know, I think it was for the best though, in this particular image, I was, I was testing out different watercolor papers um, and stretching the watercolor paper. And the the piece I had ended up really being junk. Yeah. You know? It was just a really bad piece of paper and I was fighting with it. You know, I, if I put too much water on it, the surface of the paper would start coming up a bit. Oh yeah, yeah. Well. And then, I, you know, I found myself then I was like, okay, well I'll just put you know, this and this and that. And I was fighting with yeah. it. You know, I'm like, you know what? Too many hassles. That means yep. stop and move on, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Hassles are not good. <laughs> hassles yeah. are not good. All right. We got more people finally, you know, coming in and saying hello. Hello, Adrian. Hello, Tom, Steve, Bun, uh, Dean. Hey, hey everyone. Uh, so, yeah, that's exactly right. You know, Dean just said sometimes you have to kill your darlings. It's rough. It's, yeah. Very, very yeah. true. The thing um, is, like, there's always that obsession to keep at it. I'm going to get the goddamn thing right. Yes. And you keep and this. Yeah, that it, one. And it's like that's that old song, you know, you're knee deep in the big money. And then you're waist deep in the big money. And you're neck deep in the big money. And the damn fool says to push on. You know, yeah. I think Woody got <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Uh, and, Tom, and, and, Tom and, you would ask the question, Greg, says, what's your favorite kind of commission to work on? One that allows me the most freedom. Very good. Yeah. Like, no, and that's pretty much it right there. 
Yeah, the one that yeah. allows you to have the most freedom. Yeah. Good answer. Yeah. You know, let's be honest about it. I do like subjects like this. I mean, they're... I've always been a fan of science fiction and fantasy, I, I, you know, and, and all that stuff. And you, you get the opportunity to do that with a, a, a great character like this and fool around with color and light. It's fun. Even though, like I said, I, the, one of the things I just did recently was a portrait of a house. That was challenging. And, and, uh, uh, and I enjoyed it, actually. You know, I really got into it, you know. And that was one, too. I think we discussed, discussed that months ago, though, already, where I made a big... <laughs> blunder i finally got to the shadow color of the house and it's like oh my god and nothing was yeah. working gene came in yeah, and off that one for me it's it's amazing that sometimes it's that singular puzzle piece yeah and it's something so obvious in your mind you think well i've done this a million times what the hell you know <laughs> sometimes it's your shit doesn't work out right excuse my english but sometimes the, it's it's interesting i think that you look at an image that may look like this is going to be vast and, 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 and difficult and problematic. And, and a lot of the times that ends up much quicker and faster to the point than something that's much simpler sometimes. Yeah. And I'm not okay, sure yeah. why that happens, but sometimes that happens. It's weird. <laughs> it does. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to draw on my memory banks here and pronounce Adam Chiat. Hopefully that's the correct pronunciation of your, of your last name. It says, do you have a favorite era Godzilla design? Well, look at it. I mean, I like them all nostalgia. You know, we just, like I say, well, G and I watched the 1954 original. And, you know, we all know what, what the original appearance looked like and everything. I like, I like this new guy. I mean, the digital. As much as I'm still like, um... You know, I, I love 3D construction stuff when it comes to special effects. I mean, that's what I fell in love with as a kid, and I still do. So I have a propensity towards that, liking it because it's a costume that somebody's wearing physically, you know. Mm -hmm. And yeah. but still, I, li I like I, the, the the design of this new one and his, the way he comes off his personality. So yeah, I mean. Uh, I, I like doing, I, I love doing this. It's the first one I did and the only one I've done. So I don't know. I mean, I may do some other ones. I may do different periods. I'm not sure. But I do like this guy, you know? Yeah, the, the new one, I mean, obviously, other than being updated for modern times, Carrie, they did a great job getting a very menacing, aggressive look. Yeah. <laughs> you know, those close ups, the eyes, fantastic, very incredible. Close. I mean, it blows me. Like I say again, you know me, I, you you know, I'm still, you know, from another era. I, computers still, special effects in film now with the computers just blow me away. To me, it's magic. It looks like magic. And I and I fantasize like what, it, what over seeing the new one, the Kong versus Godzilla. And I always do with these new digital ones. I sit there, I'm sitting there watching it and imagining sitting next to George Pal, whom I met who was the producer director of when worlds collide destination moon the war of the worlds i think the apex sci-fi alien invasion movie the time machine and he was a special effects master expert of his era and and or any of his his special effects guys that he worked with john fulton who did the Special effects for Paramount. He did the Red Sea opening for DeMille's Ten Commandments. I imagine sitting next to one of these guys, watching this digital stuff on screen and thinking what the hell is going through their minds as they watch it. It's like, <laughs> how the hell was that done? Look at that water. Well, the camera's moving through all that stuff and buildings and people and monsters falling. And it, look at the. I could just see them freaking out because I'm. You know what I mean? That's what I would yes. be. Just totally flabbergasted. Like, what the hell is this? <laughs> and, I mean, now it's all just commonplace. And generally, I mean, it pisses me off when people say, oh, that old stuff. Look at you. It's really <laughs> cheesy. You know, not realizing these are genius people on the set improvising and coming up with this stuff. You know, in a moment. Give me a... 
a, a building blowing up with a ray gun shooting at it. I need it tomorrow. My, you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> run home, run the shops, try to find stuff, piece it together, figure it out. You know, working with the materials and the technology available at the time. Yeah. Under time constraints and budget. Incredible. You yeah. stop and think like uh, George Powell's time machine. I think he brought that in for under a million dollars and that was 1960. And even 1960, that was, that was not a big, I mean, that was a very, very small budget because he knew ex mm. he was very well planned. He knew exactly how to make a film, how to structure it, not to overdo anything. There's no ego involved, you know, and yeah. boom, uh, those people are, were masters. You know, well, not not to say that the present contemporary ones are. I'm talking about the attitude of viewers who kind of like have a you know that state of mind. All the old stuff, yeah, it's so cheesy looking. You know. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a that's a common occurrence in any uh, genre of of yeah. art. You know, whether it's you know you know music, you know yeah. people that only listen to modern pop. That right. can't understand classical music, you right? Know, or, or, yeah, big band era or whatever. You know? Yeah, yeah. There's always always that that viewpoint of the old is bad. Yeah, you know? yeah. That's no. why they had to. That's why they had to come up with the phrase "senior citizen," because it's not good to call a person an old person. You can't say that. <laughs> you can't say that. That's like I always found that so goddamn offensive. I'm 82. I can talk. You know, I find it yep. offensive that you have to call old people like me oh he's a senior citizen like you have to <laughs> you have to put this label on it like you can't say old like old is bad well what the hell are are the young people junior citizens how come nobody calls them junior citizens <laughs> you, you know it really is an offensive <laughs> phrase to me it's like old is not good which is a crock of shit <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay. Oh, we got a question here. Greg, can you suggest the brand or type of colored lights uh, for those of us that may want to use or shoot our own photo reference? Uh, what the hell are they? I, you know, I just went to, uh, where we go, Gene? We went to Home Depot, I think, and they have these colored lights. Uh, they're, uh, yeah. what, what kind of lights were they? Do you remember? They were, just colored floodlights. They were the colored floodlights. You know, they got the primary colors and secondary colors. That's what I got. Simple as that. And I lit up the uh, Godzilla, you know, stuff with those colored lights, you know? Yeah. Red light, purple light, you know, yellow light. But uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this, Greg. Typically, when you're, you're shooting photo reference, you don't use colored lights no i don't correct? You just use a regular white light yeah yeah uh, and then you do the colors in, in your mind right yeah totally photo floods generally or if it's outside i'm you know you're shooting in daylight whatever that happens to be but or this i just wanted to try out the colored lights that i had on this you know on this guy gene bought yeah. this for me and i just uh wanted to see what would happen i had the lights so i wanted to use them normally no i don't I don't rely on the color of the photographs that I take or that I find. It's like that gets all altered for whatever the picture is that I'm painting. Got you. Yeah. Well, because it's got to go through the digital process, then the printing process, and however the paper uh, absorbs the ink and right and all of that. Uh, but now that you've used the colored lights in this Godzilla for the reference, do you do you think it's going to be something that you stick with and do again or yeah, I might. Eh. Yeah, no, no, I might. I might. So certain things happen where the colors blend. Mainly it's for me to see what not so much the 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 uh, color of the singular light, but where they blend, where they become a mix of color, and what happens there. You know, generally you you, you can figure it out logically. Just applying logic, you can you you know how to move from one color to the next in terms of blends. But sometimes stuff happens like that, you know, well, many, come on, many, uh, nature does it a lot better than you can do it in your mind. At least, you know, I can, you know, so to see it a lot of times, yeah, you, you might get ideas there or something might happen that you would not have thought of. Yes. 
No. It, it, either way. You know, doesn't matter. <laughs> Alexander Davenport says that the, he this might be the most dynamic Hildebrandt that he's seen. Really? Well, that's a good, I like that. I like to hear that about the latest picture that I'm working on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you never want it to look at and say, oh, oh man, he's lost it, man. That's like, yeah, he, that's... Um, remember the stuff he used to do? No, you don't want to hear that. <laughs> but that's the beauty, I mean, like of us graphic artists, right? Mm -hmm. Think, you know, you don't, age doesn't mean anything as long as you're functioning. Yes. You know, like as long, like, as, as, long as the brain is still there and the motor skills. Uh, yeah. Have it's not like failed you. I mean, and hopefully you learn more and you get better. Hopefully. You know. Hopefully. It, it, it's a matter of constant exploration. That's what the thrill of it all is to me. You're constantly exploring, you know? Yeah. I mean, and that's there's also a willingness there to to keep exploring, to keep moving, to stay current. Uh, yeah. To, uh, well, know. stay current and, and, and hopefully, I mean, there's always this kind of like fine line thing of like not repeating yourself, but yet maintaining what you've learned and you know at the same time. You know what I'm saying? You're operating out of a yeah. bag full of stuff that you've gathered all your life and you keep going to it because that's experience and you know you know yes. that how, yep. how that's going to work out but yet at the same time you've got to break out of it hopefully to keep growing and moving yeah to to prevent stagnation yeah yeah that ability to be able to constantly jump into the white space so to speak for the unknown, you know? Yep. So we've got, uh, I got another question here. Do you find yourself enjoying working with one color to explore its potential or just because you like it? Uh, uh, do you get the question? No, Tom, if you, can you explain uh, a little bit more of, of what you mean? Because when I, when I read that, I get that it's only, he's only using one color and obviously, you know, Greg uses a lot of really tries to get the whole uh, color wheel yeah. in there in some fashion, yeah. unless you're purposefully limiting, limiting the right. palette. So if. Uh, yeah. Like, like talking that way, just jumping. That's what this thing has. It's basically almost the entire spectrum is in this picture. Yep. The, uh, the one color I would say that, um, has been a staple of your work for quite some time, um, is the dioxazine purple. Yeah. That and, was a major discovery for Tim and me. Yeah. And, and not that it's a foundation of any of the light in your work. No, but it, it, it's the foundation of the shadow. Yep, exactly. Uh, it's that it, concept. Again, my, my color, light and color approach is warm light, cool shadow, cool light, warm shadow. If there's a warm light on a subject, there's a cool shadow. If there's a cool light on a subject, there's a warm shadow. So purple is the cool of warm, of your warm light. <laughs> purple is the warm of your cool light, blue. So it's in the middle. Yep. That logic hits didn't come be, out of studying that and having it go clunk right off the bat. We just were looking for a color to go to shadow color with back in the our first time we used it was on our own novel, Urshirak. And we were looking for a color to paint into because we chose not to paint into black some years before, Tim and me. Because yep. we, that, as you move into your shadow color that you're, you're heading towards, it needs to have color in it or else we, you know, for our thinking, not that you couldn't do it and you, people have done it and it looks great. But for our thinking, we needed to have color in that shadow area it not just gray it down and make it darker black. So how, what the hell color is that? You know, 
and again going back to the stuff that we did for the Lord of the Rings back in in the paint all those forty something paintings for the rings, we we were we were using burnt umber with some Payne's gray in it as the darkest color for mm-hmm. the most part. And we were looking for another shadow color for when we started our novel Urshaw. We wanted to get more intense and we we went to the art store, that's what Tim and I would do. We, all right, just go to, to the art store, hmm, where's the color? What color didn't we use before? And we discovered that color, and that was it, you know. So that color for me is almost in 97% of the paintings that I do. I paint into that color. Yeah, Even though there, I mean, that, it's, it's really been a, def, a defining characteristic of of your work you know since that since that time you know uh which has aided in the the saturation and the pop of of your colors yeah it you does know? especially if you paint like with this one and many other ones i do i paint the whole canvas that color before i start so you're painting mm-hmm. light on dark and you remember when we first started this it was all black and i painted this breath first of all so yes. then I painted yep. that, so you, you instantly see that it's lit against that really dark surface. You get the sense of lighting, you know? Yeah. I could never figure out when you go to the museum, the Met, and see, or the reproductions of the old standard, I guess it was, where you would wash it all in with burnt umber or something. It's an underpainting. Yeah. Yep. And, you know, you'd go and you look at, I don't know who, Velasquez or... And you see exterior sky, and there's brown in it because it was all underpainted in brown. And you're th- I'm thinking, it wasn't until the so called impressionists that you know, let's get truth to nature, no. you know, Boom. kind of like things. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, let's go out. There's a sky, there's no brown in there. I mean, unless you want to paint a polluted <laughs> sky, you know, that's another story. <laughs> but you know, just, and it was always that brown, you know, it was always kind of weird to me. <laughs> could never quite get that. <laughs> yeah. So we get a. Um, so yeah, Tom. Hopefully that. Other other than that purple, I don't think that you've ever focused in, at least in your commercial work that I know of, focused in on like you know what I really want to explore the nature of red or anything like that. It's come from a much more practical. Well, no. Here, I. Now that we're talking, I'm thinking I have tried different things out when we. Gina and I first started working together, and, and she was repping me, and we did the first book that she repped for me was Charles Dickens' the Christmas Carol, mm-hmm. and and that that was in. Here, I got, let me get my cat out of here. He's gonna he's gonna jump up onto the stand and, and screw everything up. <laughs> <laughs> and and with the Christmas Carol. I was trying different colors out to go into the shadows. In fact, I think on some of them, if I remember right, I was using dark phthalo cyanine green with, I think, purple in it to paint into the shadow. Like the ghost of Christmas present, I think, when Scrooge comes in, he's by the fireplace and stuff. Whether it worked or not, I don't know. I can't, you know, and I might look at it now and say, oh my God, that's horrible. But yeah, they, those, they, you, they look great to me. <laughs> you try different. And then, of course, yeah, then when we did Dracula, I made a, we did, we, I illustrated, Jim was publishing, she had a publishing company, and we were going through public domain books that we both loved, stories, and I would illustrate them. And when we chose Dracula, Bram Stoker's original, and Jean would always find a first edition and print the text from that first edition. And in this case, I made a conscious decision to go against my previous thought that I won't use, I won't paint into black as a shadow. I consciously used black and not purple for that. But I I had to fit it into my color theory of warm, light, cool shadow, cool, light, warm shadow. So I always thought of it as a color in that particular breakdown, you know? Yep. Yeah. I can, I'll quote Bob Patillo uh, from back in the day. Sometimes wow. black is black. <laughs> Sometimes it is. <laughs> so yeah. We, I get, we got a couple other like, good good questions coming in here, Greg. Um, 
which I'm going to see which one to address first, because I do want to talk about each of these. Um, I think this will be the quickest one. I can hear your roosters. Yeah, there, there's the squirrels jump on the line of the bird feeder, knock the feed to the ground, and now the roosters come up and eat the bird feed off the ground. <laughs> <laughs> so there, I had a bear take it down the other night. Really? Oh, my God. Yeah, stood up on its hind legs, reached up, and just grabbed it. They pull them down, man. They just... <laughs> yeah. So uh, Mario Lagrange here said he is about to paint a 3D mural on a wall. He typically works in oil paints, but he has to use acrylics for this job. Mm -hmm. Any major tips for acrylics to help him avoid frustration? <laughs> I can't. I've never painted. I tried oil painting only once. And, and yeah. to avoid that frustration, I started with acrylic. I kept up with acrylics. I couldn't, I can't, to me. No, I'll, give, I'll give you two, two practical ones that, that from Greg. Uh, the Tupperware. Okay, on, there you go. Aluminum foil, for, you know, so would you mind grabbing your Tupperware container? So Greg stores his wet paints in Tupperware containers on a, just an aluminum foil pallet. Yeah, it makes airtight here here's my palette for godzilla's breath and i and i yep. spray it down with a you know a, but he's talking about oil so yeah i put spray it down with one of these you know and put it in the container and it stays as long as you want it to keep i've, I've kept working with certain colors so long that they started to get mold on them yeah you know so, you gotta be careful of that but uh now with oil I don't know. Yeah, keep your oil in these these airtight containers. But as far as mixing your colors, I when I when I tried oil many 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 years ago, I I basically took the same approach. I mean that Tim and I had evolved. It was like very. Uh, it was not a loose, globbed up palette. It was very clearly defined piles of paint from the highlight to the shadows. Like that, you know. Mm -hmm. this, this is the the Godzilla breath from the white over here on this side, all the way to the darkest, and we'd keep the pile clear, each pile of paint clear from each other, not mixing them all together and getting up with some under un, non understandable thing. So, <laughs> and you know, and and make sure that you just simply took it from that palette and applied it here in the right order. Nope. So I don't other know. than that, I'll also summarize because you've over the course of all these live streams, you've given several very practical tips. Again, one, keeping it in the airtight Tupperware container to avoid drying it out, because if your paints dry out on you, that's going to be frustration Two, using the plant mister on a regular basis to keep that moist as you paint, as you as you paint the other one is mixing enough paint to do the job. Yes. Because trying to remix something is going to be a pain in the butt later. Yep. Keep it if it's for, certainly if it's for yourself, that's one thing, but especially if it's for a client, either, you know, a, a private or, or the publisher, because they may have changes that you're going to have to make. So you better keep yep. that paint working so that you can, you know, go back and do that. You know? Yep. I, I, you know, I match colors. I mean, people have old paintings and they and they've gotten scratched over the years and they and Gene gets them and I I'll match the colors and re, retouch them you know yeah it's it's I, I'm pretty good at remembering all the colors that I use the thing is though you know, the, the the big difficulty is not so much the color it's the value because this acrylic dries at a different uh uh you know uh, uh value level as as opposed to when it's wet you know yeah so you have to kind of like figure that or take that into account as you're mixing your paint up of that value shift that's going to happen you know and yep. it's all doable <laughs> another question is uh, alexander he, he's been commissioned to paint 44 dragons which is a hell of a commission and 44 yeah so what's your what he's asking what what's your biggest gig the longest the biggest gig uh Well, I mean, um, uh, 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 Tim and I were painting uh, one big gig we did was uh, 
the Marvel Masterpieces trading card set, which I think was 150 something paintings. 150. Yep. 100. Gene said 158 paintings, which uh, we did. We painting time, not drawing time, not layout time, not photography time, but actual painting time was six months for 158 paintings. So that was a pretty intense, fast gig. But then. Shadows of the Empire, too, right? The castle there by you, be careful. Yeah, Shadows of the Empire was about 100 cards. That was a Star Wars thing. And, uh, and well, I mean, I've done a lot of books for when Gene had Unicorn Publishing. We would do, I would do 20 paintings and 10 black and whites per book. In some years, I did two books. Some One year, I did three books in one year. And that was alone. The other one, the, the painting, the Marvel Masterpieces with my twin brother. Terry and the Pirates was a daily Sunday strip that Tim and I did while we were doing the Marvel Masterpieces set, which was a realistic <laughs> strip of, you know, seven days a week, seven, day, seven days of art. Yeah. I mean, how many days? 365 days of artwork that you had to produce. And, you know, <laughs> the... the, the, the Plus, I've done lots, lots of kids' books in the past, way long before I got famous for Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings was 43, 43 paintings? 43. 43 yep. paintings. Uh, you know, lo uh, lots of stuff. As a, uh, we got another one, practical question of when you're working on a commission piece, is it helpful to have the client watch or is it more stressful? <laughs> I don't want any client watching me while I paint. <laughs> it, it's too yeah very stressful I did that once well i mean i painted at shows you know we've done comic yeah. con and, and i've done even this you know even uh yeah here over the lady, yeah, but, lady death yeah lady death and i started this one on camera and i and i think i said this is a little more anxiety provoking because I'm, if i've got a painting underway already like this it's all mm -hmm. established i know it's pretty much on its way i'm not having to run into too much stuff. I'm, I've got it pretty much all figured out. Now I'm just finishing it. That, that's not a, that's no sweat that, you know, and, but it, it, there's a, it's an interesting thing. I mean, we, Gene, we used to do the Barrett's Jackson auto auction show. There was several artists. You'd take a booth at that show because they had like these vendor booths and there I'd be painting and there's this giant crowds of people coming by and you'd end up with 20, 30 people circled around you. And I've done it at, at comic shows to either not San Diego, but New York Comic Con. Mm -hmm. And there's a weird thing that you can arrive at. You think you can't do it sort of kind of, you know, cause it is private, but you can go click. There's some switch you find in your head to turn it all off and completely be here, which is what you do anyway. Right. When you're working. Yeah, you're one hundred percent, one thousand percent here, and you can as, do as that as long as no one says your name, <laughs> or is that, or that's a piece of crap. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like it can be done, but I prefer not doing it that way. Let's put it that. Let's put it that way. <laughs> prefer me and it sitting here with music on. You know, for the most part, music yeah. not all the time. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, man, we get, get a lot of people commenting. Thank you all very, very much. We appreciate it. Um, you said, you know, you someone's mentioning that you painted uh, the Obamas when they were elected president. Uh, yep. Do you have any plans to maybe do the Bidens or any kind of cor uh, coronavirus memorial or anything like that? Uh, I have. No, I'm not going to paint any uh, presidents right now. I mean, you know, you can't, you, I wanted to, I forgot, we tried, you can't submit one, I don't think. It's not, you, it doesn't work that way. They choose, you know. It's like, yeah. and I, I get that, you know. Well, presidents can't accept gifts. Presidents can't accept gifts, that's what Gene just told me. You go into the National Archives, which is kind of like the last scene of Lost of the Raiders. They go into the National Archive, Gene says, that's like the last scene in the Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know. It gets lost. <laughs> so, no, I, you know. But as far as the coronavirus, uh, you know, possibly, yeah, I, you know. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. Oh. I've done a lot of stuff. What? 
somebody's asking if we're going to do any what? What was the question exactly, Keith? Uh, Keith's asking. You know, any, uh, pr uh, maybe a portrait of Biden or anything that is a memorial to a memorial to uh, what, what the COVID uh, pandemic. You mean the people who died? The, pe the, pe the people who died, I would assume, right? To that, I mean, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's like. Right. Yeah, we did stuff for 9-11 and, you know, and fundraising for widows and orphans of, of all the, you know, the first, uh, yep. you know, and stuff like that. But I, I don't know. I haven't thought about it right now, you know, truthfully. Yeah, it's fine. Um, oh, we got a new person commenting named some person. That's great. They want, what does your passion for art feel like? <laughs> feel like i don't know i don't know i've never ha not had it so i don't know what it feels like not to be that way you get me it's an obsession <laughs> or the interest that you have that keeps you alive and I, it's hard to tell you I, I don't know it's like <laughs> <laughs> i guess for you everybody look at it makes me feel good what the hell can i say it's it's not a drag it's like I'm doing what I love to do. Um, it's fantastic. It's like, I can't imagine that I want to do anything else. You know? And yeah. So it's, it's a great thing and it feels great. That's, that's what it feels like. It feels great. <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it's a healthy obsession. Right. Yeah, obsession. <laughs> I mean, I call it OCB, not OCD. It's obsessive compulsive behavior. <laughs> yeah, unless you're that way, I don't know if you get anywhere, right? Yeah, you have to be obsessed and compelled. Yeah, and I think yeah. that's something that you know you're born with. I think if you have that, I I don't think you can teach that, right? I don't think I, I I've always, I can't remember not being that way. You're, there's this obsession to figure it out, to get at it, it whatever it is you're pursuing. Yeah, you know, yeah. and, and and that's. There's a driving need, want that that compels me to keep at that. Because yes. there's a sense that you never get it right, whatever it is. Yes. That it's so it's that carrot that's dangling. You know, I used to get really freaked out about that stuff because it, most things were dissatisfying to me once I'd finished them. Uh, then finally, you get well. That's just that's part of the that's part of the process. Dissatisfaction. That keeps keeps me going because I mean I'm going to get it right even though intellectually I know that I'll never reach the carrot it's always going to be out of reach but yeah that, that's the way I want it I don't want to get there and in a sense you know what I mean it's a weird kind of conversation you you don't really want to ah oh, you got it all there it's over with no I've got it all right now what's next now what yeah or maybe that's I don't know whatever. Uh, someone's asking, okay, so, uh, do you wet the canvas as you paint? No, no, nope. That's, no, I guess that's, I, I know, I know people have done that. They've, they've kept it sprayed. So they keeps, keeps it wet and working so they can smear stuff around. No, I mean, I, I don't, you, you evolve a method of operation where you don't need to do that. You know? Yeah. It's, it's like, the, yeah. The only time I've seen you do that is when. You're grounding out the background. Yeah, I'll, I'll paint the I'll paint this black with a spray bottle just to thin it out because I I just want a very thin coats of paint. I don't want it to get all globby, and and that that's it. But other than that, no. Because I mean I it, I don't just paint wet. It's wet. It's dry brush. It's all kinds of stuff that you're, I'm mixing together as I paint a picture. You know. Yeah. So it, it I don't depend on it being wet. I tried I tried an extender once. Where you can you squeeze this stuff and you mix your paint yep. with that the acrylic with that and it extends the drying time. I forgot exactly how long, not a half hour, hour. I don't know what the hell it was. I don't remember. But the stuff yep. I couldn't get used to it. It had a kind of a weird texture to it that I couldn't get used to painting with. You know? Yeah. Got you. People want to know what kind of music you listen to. <laughs> <laughs> I, I earlier today when I started this, when I came down here, I put on. Uh, Franz Liszt's Dante Symphony. <laughs> Abandon hope, all ye who enter here. The inferno, you know. I yes. love, 
So, I mean, I did. That's what I played this morning. And I'll play classical music. I'll play... Uh, primarily, I put, I put on a classic rock station, Pandora. Hit the button, yeah. and I'll get a mixed bag of Deep Purple or Inagata De Vida or you know, yeah. Epitaph, King Eagles Crimson, whatever. I don't, whatever, you know. Um, not not, not to say that's the only kind of music I like, but I'm saying no. It helps no you me. listen to a wide variety. Yeah, I, I like a lot of stuff. Film music, yeah. I'm nuts about film composers. I mean, my God, you know, Marconi. I mean, when he died just recently, you put on any one of his, mm -hmm. any of their soundtracks, any of the greats, it's like a whole symphony in itself, you know. Yep. Do you have any tips for posing your live models? Uh, tips for posing them well i mean first of all uh, do your uh, it, uh, yeah my tip would be get it, work out your pose exactly what you want before the model you get the model so that you know you're going to at least get that make sure that and then try to get the model conform to that sketch that you agreed to or your clients agreed to you know or you agreed to and then you know if something else happens in the process of improvisation we'll just keep shooting pictures you know, mm -hmm. but it uh, depends on the model. I mean, you get a good model, they'll, they'll fall right into it. They're, they're, they're good actors, you know, and they, and they can act. And so, but I, I don't use professionals all the time. I mean, mainly I don't, I mean, I use who happens to be around, you know, yep. grab somebody. <laughs> come, come here. I'm just standing here. <laughs> uh, the thing I will, I will add to that. Um, just having been around you while you, you know, you've shot some models and things like that is to take your time and make sure you get your lighting right. You know, yeah. I know, I know that when I've personally shot models, I felt bad for having them in those poses. And then I've rushed and rushed and rushed and yep. then ended up not getting what I needed. Yeah. There you go. That's key. <laughs> and I'll, I'll still do that once in a while. You know, because you're, you're. I'm always aware of the of the plight of the model, that they're they're really, you know, they're, you know, it's a tough thing. Sometimes you're, especially when you're doing superhero type stuff. You know, you get them in yep. these strenuous poses, and it's tough on the person, and you're aware of that, and so you're kind of rushing through. Yeah, getting the light just right. Sometimes you don't get a hand position exactly where you want it. Maybe you want it, you know, like that, as opposed to the way it ends up like that. You know. So mm -hmm. watch all the details that you're the model, you know, checking your sketch and, and making sure that everything reads white and, and, and is not, there's no tangents, you know, like a hand coming over just something a little bit in the wrong way, that kind of stuff. Just be aware yeah. of it as you shoot. Yeah. Yep. And so, uh, you know, with that, we're going to start to to wrap up, Greg, because I know that uh, Jean has a conference call that she has to take here in a little bit. Um, so, so we got to wrap this up, but I, I do want to point out to the, the people that are on now and watching, uh, if you weren't on at the beginning, go back and just check out the beginning of the live stream. And uh, you may or may not catch some fumbling around as, as we always do, because that's kind of just our, our shtick at this point, <laughs> having some kind of technical issue. But uh, Greg, at the beginning of the video, Greg talks about, um, uh, uh, the issue that he had to overcome with with that dragon and how he had forgotten that the the different heads shot different colored powers and so he had the incorrect head placement shooting out the fire so he talks about what he did to solve uh that issue uh so everybody you know if you if you weren't here for the beginning go back and and do yourself a favor and check that out because it, it is pretty interesting to see how how the painting got to where it is now. Uh, so, yeah, this this picture I'll be done with it this week. This is what our, our third session with this painting, I think. Yep, yep. And I mean, I could see how far it jumped just from Tuesday when I sat, sent out the email and I had the picture of it to wh to where it is now. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll, um, I'll be finished with this in the next several days, so I I don't know what I'll be working on next week. But it won't be this more than likely, you know. All right, cool. But if, if it's still around, if it hasn't shipped out already, uh, 
it'd be great to see it. We'll take a look uh, all at it. Yeah. Up and, uh, and anything. But anyway, uh, as, as, yeah. as always, everyone, we, we appreciate you coming into the live stream. We appreciate all the comments and, and the discussions. Um, it, it makes it so much more fun and interesting for Greg to, and I to have something else to, to converse about. Uh, as always, if you are interested in a commission, please contact Gene at spiderwebart.com. That's J-E-A-N at spiderwebart.com. And to check out Greg's work and to purchase it, visit the URL down in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. All right. So everybody have a great night. Thank you again, as always, Greg. And uh, thank you. See you later, my friend. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Good night. Let me just yep. turn it off right now. Click. There it is. Click. <laughs> well, then leave it there. Click. Okay, so here's that. Okay, stop. <laughs>